All right, welcome back guys. Today we're gonna to talk about the blue catfish, Ictolaris fricatus, arose in the Oligocene some 30 million years ago. Last shared a common ancestor with a flathead catfish right around 40 million years ago. Probably the sportiest of the three major catfish species in North America, definitely the most sought after. Mostly because of their accessibility and logistical ease. I mean, you really don't need a lot to go after them. Uh, you want to be packing some heavy gear if you're thinking about uh, hooking into some giants, which there are a lot of them. Mostly we're going to cover things like native home range, current range, uh, diet, migration, uh, their spawn, and perhaps even some tall tales from a bygone era. So here you can see a picture of their native range. Uh, it stretches pretty much from Minnesota to Guatemala. Uh, in the U.S., however, their native range is basically the greater Mississippi watershed. So it's basically the Mississippi River and all of the tributaries that drain into it. As for their current home range, it has expanded tremendously, as you can tell from this illustration. The orange is their native range and the maroon color is going to be their current home range. These things have been introduced to many new fisheries, most notably would probably be Virginia and its tidal waters, uh, their extreme tolerance to things like brackish water and hot and cold temperatures has really allowed them to thrive almost anywhere. To make these matters even worse in that department, their mostly herbivorous and omnivorous diets allow them to thrive even further. The Chesapeake Bay area is considered to be one of the worst areas affected by invasive blue catfish. But this is kind of a tricky scenario mostly due to the blue cats feeding on blue crabs, which is the largest, most profitable fishery in that area. But in that same breath, blue cats are aiding in the spread of hydrilla and Asian clams, both of which are invasive. So you have activists on both sides of the argument. They were also stocked in South Carolina in 1965 with an initial wave of about 180 subadults in a Santee Cooper Reservoir, another area of quite a significant amount of butthurt for many, including myself, Predominantly because this is the home of the current all-tackle world record channel cat. In July of 1964, W.H. Whaley reeled in a 58-pounder. Since the introduction of the blue cat, I think it's safe to say the channel cat record is the safest record in the country. Growth rates. Everybody wants to know about growth rates. Just keep in mind these are usually the hardest things to find. Usually because it's a ton of math and there's not a lot of descriptive data just numbers. However, this one was a bit more straightforward than the flathead data. The data for blue cats was also much greater than the flathead for obvious reasons. They could catch a lot more of them. The data was also a lot more varying. Blue cats grew at a different rate in different fisheries, noticeably so. Unlike flathead, which tended to be fairly uniform across the board. So it takes them about four to five years to get to a pound and a half. That sounds like a long time. And it is a long time. Blue cats in the early years of their life have an extraordinarily slow growth rate, right? This is one of the reasons why they've been tried several times in aquaculture uh, to no avail. Uh, channel cats just, they're just better. They grow faster in the early stages. They're also less susceptible to things like bacteria. And also blue cats tended to get really stressed out really easily, which also hampered their growth but its rate increased by a full pound in its sixth year. And every year after that, marginally increased as it got older, whereby about year 10, you could see rates as high as seven pounds per year. Again, tons of variation in these studies. We're talking thousands of fish, however, so the science was solid. Authors did note that an adequate food stock attributed heavily to their growth rates, which leads us into a perfect segue to their diet. I'm super excited to talk about it because I'll be honest with you, it, it shocked me. I was not expecting this. I was expecting it from channel cats, not blues. Something else that was quite comical was learning how many people hate blue catfish and not for the reasons I thought they would. So I went to about 30 or 40 different websites. Uh, all of them had studies that were conducted at different times and places but the bias against them in the Chesapeake Bay area is overwhelming. Okay, these people really don't like blue cats. I mean, they would go down the list of all their diet items and the bottom one would always be blue crab. 
And from that point on, they had nothing nice to say about them. So you can kind of see where these people were pretty upset about their blue crabs. But I digress. In the first few years of their lives, they are incredibly herbivorous with some omnivorous behavior. However, as they get older, they begin to prey more and more on other living creatures. This includes things like mollusks, crabs, all forms of bait fish, crustaceans, and other catfish, and birds. Interestingly, however, they never fully kick their appetite for salads. In fact, some studies concluded that 50% of a blue's diet is vegetable matter. 50%! That's huge! One of the ways that they figured this out was simply by cutting them open. And you would literally find just wads of grass and algae and all sorts of plant matter. One interesting tidbit that I found about how they feed is they typically use the same thing that all catfish use. They use their barbells. These are like, imagine you had a nose and a finger and a tongue all wrapped up into one little appendage to help you find food. That's what a barbell is on a catfish. However, in clear water conditions, they become almost exclusive eyesight predators chasing bait fish. I, I thought that was interesting. One of the other methods that they've been observed feeding was laying beneath or just downstream from schools of bait fish and stripers and wipers would come in, go through the bait bowl, knock a few of them out, perhaps not eat all of them, kill a few of them, injure some of them, and they would simply just gobble them up. And they've also been observed uh, sitting downstream below dams, uh, basically just eating all the fish to get caught in the dam, the turbines or whatever is spinning in there. I'm not a damnologist. So, and they just, they just gobble them up. All right, let's talk about how blues make baby blues. It's pretty straightforward. Preferred water temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 84 degrees Fahrenheit with 80 to 81 being considered optimal. Typically, this occurs April to June. Males build the nest, pull guard duty. Females produce approximately 4,000 eggs per pound of body weight. Nests are typically chosen by isolation and areas of structure, debris, so behind logs, rocks, pockets, such as dugout banks and undercuts. Eggs hatch in six to 10 days, depending on water temperature. Male guards have fry for a few days and then they disperse on their own. Blue cats become sexually mature between four and seven years of age for about 24 inches. There were some uh, studies that said it may be between 16 and 24 inches. So, so how much do these things migrate? Well, they really do seem to be the most migratory of the three major species. This depends tremendously on water temperature, but it's not limited to. They all seem to migrate to one degree or another. So they're basically moving downstream in the cooler months or the winter time, and they're moving upstream in the summer or the warming months, typically to spawn. Some blues have been observed traveling as much as over 100 miles. So how big do these things get? Big. The fishing world is fraught with tails like the elusive Volkswagen-sized catfish below the dam. Now, I don't think there are any Buicks below the currents of North America. I do think, however, that at one point in time, most certainly, that there was giants swimming under there. For example, a 315-pound blue catfish caught in 1866 near Portland, Missouri. And just a couple of years later, in 1868, another massive blue was caught and weighed in at 242 pounds. Now, you might be asking yourself, how is that even possible? There's such a despair between our current world records versus 315 pounds. I mean, you're talking twice the fish, more than twice the fish. How, how would something like that be even possible? Well, there's a couple of factors you need to consider. One, this is pre-industrial revolution. Why is that important? Because after we started building shit, we started flooding our rivers with poison. Okay, we were dumping everything in the rivers. I mean, that's just what we were doing. We were an industrialized nation that was burgeoning into the new world of becoming this industrialized powerhouse. And there wasn't any regulations back in those days. There was no environmental protection agency. These companies were just dumping everything. And not just companies. I mean, you're talking agriculture. You're talking, you know, municipal waste was just being dumped into our rivers. You also have to take into account things like this is pre-commercial fishing time period. And there wasn't any dams being built at this time. Not to mention, no one cared about records in those days. 
There wasn't anybody out there. There was no IGFA out there. You could just turn your pictures of your fish in. There wasn't a, a CO you could call around the corner to get your weight verified. No one cared. It's hard to say what people were pulling in. Mark Twain even had stories of giant catfish. It was, it, it was said in those times that pulling in fish out of the Missouri and the Mississippi between 125 pounds and 200 pounds was common. So given all those factors, this is what we're left with. This is the current all tackle world record blue cap. This bad boy was hauled in by Richard Anderson in 2011 from a fishery known as Kerr Lake or Bugs Island. Now, Richard's been pretty tight-lipped about the exact location as well as the bait he was using. Although there are a lot of rumors about chicken breasts floating around, it doesn't really matter. It's an amazingly huge fish. One of the areas that I decided not to cover was habitat. And the reason why is because these things are found in almost every environment. They're, they can be found in current, they can be found in deep water, they can be found in shallow water. They can be found along break lines. They can be found in coves. They can be found in ponds. These things can, can do all right pretty much anywhere they are. And they feed on almost anything. So they can be found virtually everywhere there is water. One of the most traditional ways to target them is a classic catfish Carolina rig and a little bit of cut bait and you're all set. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I plan to be doing a lot more of these. If you would, go ahead and smash that like button. Think about subscribing if you haven't subscribed. It's free and it really helps me out a lot. Go ahead and leave your suggestions down in the comment section. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.